Stanford University. I'm going to talk about really two things. Uh, one is some, some of the novel design aspects of the cap and trade program that was recently enacted uh, by the Air Resources Board, the California Air Resources Board, this past December. And I'm going to give you some feel for uh, the, the innovativeness of the regulation that was adopted of the cap and trade program, the carbon market. Uh, some feel for the, in effect, the regulatory negotiation and how skillfully Mary Nichols and her team at ARB managed that negotiation, especially in the face of, I mean, let's face it, the, you know, the worst recession since the Great Depression and the, the political blowback against um, environmental regulation that, that might have occurred. And then, so this is sort of the, the happy part of the story. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the risks that that regulation is likely to face now that it has been implemented, now that agency action is final. Um, well, it's, yeah, it should be final. It's not quite final yet, but when, when agency action does become final, interested parties, parties that will be impacted by the regulation, will have a chance to challenge that regulation in court if they want to. And there are a number of avenues along which uh, they're likely to do so, uh, that someone is likely to do so. So I'll talk about three of those avenues and give you some sense for how a court will think about uh, the regulation in the context of, of state and federal constitutional law. And, and I'm not going to necessarily tell you how a court will rule because I have no idea. I think the issues are very complicated. But I'll give you a feel for the factors that will be important as courts consider this regulation. Um, so let's see. I think at the outset, it's important to emphasize that what is going on in California right now is, 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 is in some sense, normal in the history of environmental regulation in the United States. What I mean by that is that um, the typical pattern for developing important new policies in environmental regulation is not comprehensive action at the federal level, as was contemplated under the Waxman-Markey legislation, prior to substantial state experimentation. Typically what happens, what happened uh, in the years leading up to the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, um, other uh, major federal pieces of legislation, was that states experimented. States enacted policies. They tried out different approaches, different approaches to the problem, different um, administrative schemes. And then the federal government chose among them and gave some states some authority to continue doing what they'd been doing. In particular, and we'll talk about this, California's special role in the, under the Clean Air Act to enact tougher uh, emission standards for cars. But in this context, what happened during the last session of Congress was somewhat unusual. The idea that the federal government would enact um, something really big, comprehensive uh, legislation that would put a cap on carbon for, I think it was 80 something, 83% of US greenhouse gas emissions was really a new thing in the world of environmental law in the United States, at least over the past 50 years or so. Um, so what we have now is, in some sense, the normal process, if it's allowed to operate. Um, and I think that um, we should be excited about that, that assuming that the California Emissions Trading Program is allowed to proceed as intended, it's likely to generate a lot of information, a lot of information uh, with respect to how a U.S. emissions trading program can function given U.S. administrative laws and the constraints that those place on agency action. A lot of information about how the U.S. economy and in particular the U.S. electricity sector is going to respond to the incentives created by an emissions trading program. And that's going to kind of, I, I, ex I would expect lower expectations on every, in, uh, amongst, uh, along every aspect of the spectrum of political persuasion. It's going to demonstrate that the sky doesn't fall 
when you have a cap and trade program in the United States. I mean, there's Europe. This guy hasn't fallen in Europe, although you know they may be socialists or uh, wards of the state or, or something like that. And, and so we, we can't totally trust what happens in Europe. Um, the now, arguably, California may be uh, the 26th state in the European Union as far as some parts of the country are concerned. But I think that we will generate a track record if the program moves forward that will provide some information um, as to the real costs of greenhouse gas cap and trade programs that are aggressive. Um, at the same time, I think we're going to find that the electricity sector isn't transformed overnight, that the great hopes that some people have had for cap and trade as sort of the answer uh, to the climate change problem pro probably won't, won't come true as well. That there's going to be a mixed picture, and we're going to learn that some aspects of the design need to be modified to work better in the US context as well. Um, so those are sort of all general remarks. I just want to tell one story from the process of adopting the rules that I think illustrates both uh, the extraordinary bargaining, bargaining skill on the part of ARB staff and also at least one what I think is truly innovative design feature um, of the draft rule that really builds on experience in the EU emissions trading scheme and the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a cap and trade program for 13 northeastern states, their electricity sectors, um, and builds on the experience and the, and the, the thinking that went into the Waxman Markey legislation. So I'm going to tell the story about offsets. Um, so offsets are essentially um, sources of emission reductions that are obtained by polluters that are covered by the cap, but which occur outside the cap. So it's a large, say I'm a large power plant. I face an obligation to reduce my emissions, or I face a cost of carbon, actually, more accurately speaking. Um, I, have an, I have a couple of options. I can reduce my own emissions if my marginal abatement cost is lower than the cost of carbon in the market. If it happens to be higher, I have really two choices, typically in a cap and trade. I can go out and buy allowances, that is, um, permits to emit issued under the cap that when you sum them up equal the cap. Or I can wander further afield and try to pay entities that are not covered by the cap to reduce their emissions, pay them to change their behavior. Um, regulation of offsets, just suffice it to say that regulation of offsets is a controversial area. Uh, and in general, business interests, um, firms that are likely to be covered by a cap and trade push very hard for as many offsets as possible, ideally unlimited quantities of offsets from as wide a geographic region outside the capped area and as many sectors outside the capped area as possible. And environmental groups tend to push for as few offsets from as narrow a scope as possible. The environmental groups fear that what will happen is that offsets will be allowed to substitute for compliance within the cap and trade that aren't backed by real reductions, um, reductions that are, 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 that are in effect crediting um, business as usual behavior on the part of firms. An offset is only working if the payment of money for the carbon credit results in a change in behavior. If no change in behavior occurs relative to what would have happened anyway, the offset is just kind of shifting paper around and reducing the overall uh, environmental performance of the cap and trade program. So just to illustrate why that's um, a tough regulatory problem, consider, consider Jim. Um, Jim lives in Palo Alto. He earns a decent living as a professor at Stanford. And he, on occasion, might choose to buy compact fluorescent light bulbs. Um, PG&E gets paid a lot of money to subsidize, to lower the cost of compact fluorescent light bulbs in stores near Jim. Um, the question you would have to answer in a carbon offset context, context is, would Jim have bought the light bulb if PG&E hadn't subsidized its price, hadn't artificially lowered its price below cost or below market? Now, for someone who's facing 
very tough budget constraints. They're living paycheck to paycheck. And I'm not saying you aren't. Uh, and um, places no value on the energy efficiency of his or her lifestyle. Pretty good bet they wouldn't have bought the compact fluorescent bulb. They might have bought an incandescent bulb because it's cheaper in the absence of a, a subsidy that brings the two into parity. On the other hand, for someone who cares a lot about those issues, who isn't living paycheck to paycheck, maybe, I don't know if you drive a car, what kind of car, say, say, say that Jim happens to drive a Prius, has already made substantial investments, maybe has even photovoltaic panels on the roof of his home, um, has made substantial investments that reflect his desire to reduce his carbon footprint, to increase the energy efficiency of his lifestyle, et cetera. Harder to say whether the PG&E subsidy made a difference. Maybe at the margin it makes some difference, but it's, it's hard to know where to come out on that. Those are the kinds of regulatory decisions that drive whether carbon offsets count. And as that example hopefully illustrates, there are some cases where it's an easy call, and there's some where it's an easy call yes or no, and there's some where, but there are many cases in the middle where it's going to be tough to determine whether behavior has really been changed by the subsidy or the payment. So, Back to the ARB. The initial proposal from the ARB was, was to allow covered firms, covered pollution sources, to use to cover 4% of their emissions using carbon offsets. Um, that's a, just to provide a little perspective, that's a very conservative number in the context of pretty much every cap and trade program that's ever been uh, proposed, rolled out. Um, in the US or globally. Uh, in the EU, the number is closer to 8%. Under the proposed Waxman-Markey legislation, which of course went down in flames, in the Senate, the number in the early years was closer to 36, 37% of emissions being covered by, at least potentially covered by these offsets, this alternative compliance. So ARB was playing hardball. Um, In the final proposal, they doubled the number, 8%, they said. That's still as tough as the European Union. So again, maybe California is the 26th state, unless luckily we're not subject to um, the EU budget problem. Well, we have our own budget problems, I guess. Um, but ARB did something else that's very clever. They increased the offsets, the number of offsets allowed, but at the same time, withdrew allowances from the market equal to that extra 4%. So they essentially left the market at um, exactly the same level of stringency, the same number of potential com fungible compliance units that could have been used, that can be used by, say, a power plant or a cement factory are going to be out in the market because ARB has taken away 4% of the allowances that would have been issued, the permits to emit, um, as opposed to these alternative compliance units. Um, what did they do with that extra 4% that they withdrew from the market? Well, they put it in what they call a strategic reserve, um, which will only release permits if prices go very high. So essentially what ARB did was to give something to regulated firms, i.e. more offsets, but also take something away. Take something away in the form of um, allowances that will only flow to the market if prices are higher than at least many in the environmental community have projected. Now I'll tell you that uh, there are private sector analyses of prices right now that suggest that pretty much all those allowances are going to come into the market. Um, in particular, Point Carbon has been, which is kind of the leading carbon analytics uh, or carbon analysis uh, service globally has projected that prices will go high enough to trigger release of many of those allowances, if not all of them, during the trading period. But for that to occur, entities in the, the California carbon market are going to be facing a very high carbon price. So they're going to be facing very strong incentives to change behavior whether or not the offsets are real. In essence, what Nichols was able to do, and, and, and I should say that industry responded very positively to this outcome. They were entirely happy with it in many respects. Um, 
the, cha the California Chamber had actually positive things to say about cap and trade when the draft rule was released. And that is surprising, to say the least. Um, and they were particularly complimentary about these design features. At the same time, environmental groups, NRDC, environmental defense, others, with the exception of groups that are philosophically opposed to offsets under any context, and those folks are generally opposed to carbon trading under any context as well, so it's not clear that they would have been supportive of anything involving cap and trade. With the exception of those environmental groups, not saying they're right or wrong, um, the, the mainstream groups were, were very positive about these changes. So what ARB was able to do was to navigate these sort of Scylla and Charybdis of California politics, right? The, the environmental groups that hold, wield enormous political power, especially um, within the California legislature, and the chamber, which especially in the current context was wielding enormous political power because of the unemployment rate, because of the recession, because of the housing bust. And ARB was essentially able to successfully implement a program which in the end is one of the toughest ever written down, was one of, is, is one of the toughest um, cap and trade rules really in existence. And that, that, it, that compares favorably to what the EU will do during, in the current context and is much tougher from an environmental perspective than the Waxman-Markey legislation, which is perhaps not surprising in the sense that California is a place that values, places a stronger emphasis on environmental issues than many places in the country. But um, it's also rather extraordinary given that California is, has been hit far harder than many other places in the country during the current recession. Um, so that's a positive. That's a, that's a real win from a policy design perspective. Um, but there are problems or there are challenges ahead for this rule. No matter how good its um, design features, it's going to have its day in court. And I'm going to talk about three potential challenges. Um, one that's been talked about a lot in the media, which I think is actually a loser, and that is a challenge based upon Proposition 26, recently enacted in um, the, the um, November elections, a proposition that basically redefines um, a large number of what have been called fees under California law as taxes. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit what that means. But two more, far more significant challenges I think that are coming will concern um, whether the cap and trade program represents an impermissible trespass into Congress's, that this is the US Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce. It's called the Dormant Commerce Clause Challenge. And um, a challenge um, likely arguing that the program has been preempted either by EPA regulation of greenhouse gas emissions or by um, FERC regulation of interstate electricity sales. So Prop 26. Prop 26 basically argues, or Prop 26 basically says that um, what have been called fees, that is, money that must be paid by a particular class of entities within California to receive a particular benefit or to fund a particular service that benefits them um, or for a permit to do something or to remedy uh, some harm that they cause on general, the general um, social welfare because of their activities are now going to be called special taxes and are going to require approval by a supermajority of the um, legislature that uh, enacts them. So that's a big change. Um, and many worried, well, some worried that this could impact the ability of the Air Resources Board to implement a cap and trade program, especially in the context where allowances, these permits to emit one ton of carbon dioxide, were being auctioned, right? So a polluter was being asked to pay some dollar amount for the right to emit a ton of carbon dioxide in order to benefit the state, in order to reduce the impact of global climate change on the state. I think this is a non-issue. Um, and the reason is that Prop 26, at least as it's been written, is fairly explicit 
in its application to laws enacted after January 1, 2010. AB 32, in case people don't know, it was enacted in 2006 and specifically allows, specifically provides for the Air Resources Board to enact fees and regulations that are necessary to effectuate its purposes. So in essence, what I'm saying is the cap and trade program under AB 32 is grandfathered in. Um, it's safe, even though the regulation creating this cap and trade program won't be finalized until sometime, I think the next ARB meeting's in February, um, where they're gonna vote on this. Um, it's safe because the authorizing legislation was enacted prior to the, the, um, the tolling of the period under which Prop 26 would redefine what had once been fees as special taxes. Um, this is not to minimize the effect of Prop 26 on environmental regulation. Moving forward, this is a big problem. Most environmental regulations are funded by fees. Um, the operation, for instance, of the Department of to Toxic Substances Control is, is largely generated by fees on polluters. And the polluter pays principle, which is something that many in California have pushed for a long time, is, is likely to be, the, the, the effectuation of that principle is likely to be really undermined by Prop 26. Probably the, the, the program in the crosshairs most immediately is something called the Green Chemistry Initiative, which is an attempt to better regulate toxic substances and products in the marketplace within California. That's likely to run afoul of this provision. But AB 32 is probably safe. So that's good. What about these other issues that really involve the relationship between federal law and federal authority and the state's authority, state law and the state's asserted authority to do something about climate change? The first and probably the, well, actually I don't wanna say which one is, is most tr troublesome, which issue is most troublesome, likely most troublesome for the Air Resources Board, but the Dormant Commerce Clause is a, is a, is a really critical issue uh, and surviving the likely dormant commerce clause challenge has been the object of lawyers at the Air Resources Board for some time, both in the design of the a, uh, AB 32 regulations and of the regulations implementing a related measure, SB 1368, which forbids long-term uh, contracts to purchase out-of-state power that is uh, very carbon intensive. So basically it bans long-term purchases of coal-fired power plant supplied electrons into California. Um, so what to say about interstate commerce? Basically, we live in a, in essentially in a customs union that's guaranteed by the US Constitution. Um, the the, that guarantee is that Congress has the right, is given the right, the explicit right to, to, to regulate interstate commerce, and by implication, states may not regulate interstate commerce. So what's the problem? The problem, in short, with AB, for AB 32 is interstate electricity sales. We are a state that likes to cite, historically has cited our coal-fired power plants in Nevada and Arizona. We import more electricity than any state in the union and a lot of that electricity is very carbon intensive. That is, it's likely to be strongly impacted by any legislation or regulation that puts a price on carbon. This issue has, well, when you talk to, to, to many people, they have the impression, even regulators, they have the impression that this issue has been settled. Um, that there were some early disputes that settlements have occurred and that, that we've moved forward beyond this issue. But I, I actually think that's, that's, that's not true. And let me just describe the two kind of realizations of this problem that we've had to date. One involves a company called INDEC, which is, operates a, a, um, a natural gas fired power plant in New York State and had entered into long-term contracts um, under which it could not pass through carbon prices associated with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, this cap and trade in the Northeast that I mentioned. So it sued New York and said, amongst other things, you are violating the Dormant Commerce Clause of the US Constitution when you tell me that I have to surrender allowances that have a financial value. 
um, because you're discriminating against my long-term power purchase agreements with out-of-state buyers. Um, New York and Reggie in general did not want to see this issue have its day in court. And so they settled. And they settled on what are apparently quite favorable terms to INDEC. Um, they basically guaranteed uh, a pool of allowances to make INDEC whole for any obligation it has under Reggie. And they did the same thing for any power plant uh, similarly situated. So they said, we just want to take this issue out of the equation. We, we, don't, we don't want to see a court rule. Um, we know a lot less about the other situation in which this problem has come up. And that is, that's a, that is um, a, a power plant called, or that would have been called Unit 3, operated by some, someone called the Intermountain Power Agency uh, that operates coal-fired power plants, I think about a gigawatt and a half of coal-fired power capacity in Utah. Unit 3 was supposed to add another 900 megawatts to that picture. And the LA Department of Water and Power is a major investor in this Utah power plant. They buy a lot of their coal-fired power from Utah, supply of cheap, low-cost electricity to this municipally owned utility. Um, the operators of these power plants sued LADWP on Commerce Clause grounds when LADWP backed out of this investment agreement because of the implementation of the ban on um, long-term purchases of coal-fired electricity from out of state. Litigation ensued. Once again, apparently under pressure from the LA city government, LADWP settled under undisclosed terms. Um, the power plant was seeking both planning costs of so $6 million plus $100 million in compensatory damages for lost revenue from the construction of this new generation facility that LA was supposed to buy power from. We don't know how much of that money we got. We also don't know, because of the settlement, how a court would have ruled. But what we do know is that the risks to the system were, were great enough that LA didn't want to see, didn't want to find out, and they didn't want a court decision ruling against the state's ability to regulate in this way. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the law because we don't know how a court's going to rule. And this really creates some uncertainty as to whether this regulation will be permitted to take effect. Um, so when a court finally sees this issue, because eventually the state will not be able to settle, and with, um, or it's, it's likely that the state will not be able to settle. And it's worth noting that it's not just private entities that are, that are gearing up to sue on this issue. State attorneys general are gearing up to sue on this issue. State attorneys general who do not like climate policy and do not like emissions trading schemes are getting ready to file suit. So we're going we're gonna to have our day in court. How will a court look at this? The first thing they'll ask is, is the law facially discriminatory? Is the, is the regulation implementing cap and trade explicitly discriminatory against out-of-state entities? Um, and the answer is, is no. It's clearly not. And it was crafted very carefully not to be. Um, if, it, back up, if, if it were found to be so, um, the court would apply something, a court would apply something, would be required by Supreme Court precedent to apply so-called strict scrutiny to the law. And I think the, the best expression of what strict scrutiny amounts to is it's strict in theory and fatal in fact to any law to which it's applied. That's not completely true that, you know, a great example of where a law has survived or a policy or regulation has survived strict scrutiny is actually the the opinions involving the University of Michigan and affirmative action, where some aspects of the affirmative action programs at Michigan passed, survived strict scrutiny review. But in the dormant commerce clause area, it is nearly universally true. There's only one exception in the entire history of dormant, clause, dormant commerce clause jurisprudence where um, a regulation that was to which strict scrutiny was applied survived judicial review. Um, so if the law is facially neutral, doesn't explicitly discriminate against out-of-staters, which we can pretty, pretty clearly rule out. It's not safe. 
then um, the court will look at whether the law impacts interstate commerce in practice. Purposes of the law are also important here. They're, they're, gonna, they're, they're used by courts to evaluate whether um, the impacts are intentional, in which case they're forbidden, or are incidental, in which case they may be permitted in ways that I'll discuss. Um, courts will also evaluate the extent to which the law is, amounts to extraterritorial regulation. What that means is states are permitted to regulate activities that occur within their state, but they're not permitted to regulate activities that occur outside the state. Um, if any of these things are true about the cap and trade program and its impact on out-of-state electricity producers, then it will receive strict scrutiny. If, however, a court finds that the law is facially neutral, that the law is neutral in its impacts, and that the law doesn't amount to extraterritorial, extraterritorial regulation, um, then it will likely apply something called pike balancing, which is a, uh, relates to a case called Pike v. Bryce Church, Bruce Church, which is about um, <laughs> The, the regulation of, of, of cantaloupe sales across state lines. You know, this, this is law. It's diverse in its facts um, and, and the fact patterns that occur. Pike balancing looks at three factors, three critical factors. It asks whether, a court will ask whether the local interest is legitimate, which, as you can see, is a pretty vague um, question. It'll ask, whether there are less burdensome options that the regulator might apply to accomplish the same ends. And then, and this is kind of the catch-all that you find in, in a lot of balancing tests in the law, it'll ask, the court will ask whether the benefits outweigh the burdens on interstate commerce. So just sort of do a, do a rough cost-benefit analysis of, of the, the, the regulation in question. Pike balancing is a, is a context in which regulations and laws do survive. And they have, over time, um, there's, a, there's a body of case law that's developed where a number of, of regulations that, that um, are facially neutral, don't um, attempt to extraterritorially extra regulate, um, do and are, and are neutral in their impact, but have impacts on interstate commerce do sur have survived. And they've survived along a number of rationales that we should feel encouraged about. In particular, resource conservation has been a legitimate purpose and has been found to outweigh um, the burdens on interstate commerce, environmental protection, consumer protection, public safety. So, so there's some hope here. But I think it's also important to emphasize that there's a lot of uncertainty. And we don't actually know how, how this is likely to play out in the AB32 context. It's worth noting, as I mentioned, that the, the, the law and the implementing regulation was designed with this challenge in mind. And the most important way in which it was designed is how the regulation is applied. The, the point of regulation is intended to avoid the appearance and the reality of interference with interstate commerce, um, facial or, um, or um, purposeful or uh, incidental impacts that are impermissible. The point of regulation for electricity sales in the, in the cap and trade program is, is um, what's called the first seller of electricity. What that means is, in the case of um, power in, that's produced within California, the power plant. That's pretty straightforward. The power plant is the first seller. In the case of power that's imported into the California market, it means the importer that sells, the, that sells that's the first um, seller of electricity within the California grid, likely to a load serving entity like PG&E or the city of Palo Alto. That at least creates a, a strong argument on the part of California that they are not attempting, that California is not attempting to regulate out-of-state power producers, 
or to um, facially discriminate against them. On the other hand, it does seem pretty clear that the firms likely to be most harmed by this regulation are those out-of-state coal-fired power plants that we depend on or we have depended on historically for a big share of our baseload generation. So how a court weighs these issues is, is at least to some extent uncertain. Um, California has, you can also see in the law and in the regulation, the attempts that California is doing to build their case to win this challenge. In particular, the emphasis on the harm to California from climate change, the emphasis on establishing the case in the law and the justifications and the findings for the regulation that there is a legitimate in-state interest in dealing with this problem. The likely rejoinder to that, and this is the real question mark, is how the court will deal with the issue of the impacts of the California program, right? Everybody knows that even if California cuts its emissions to zero, the damages to, to California from climate change are likely to be reduced only marginally. So it's not necessarily clear that um, we can win on the, on the argument that the benefits to California outweigh the burdens if a court finds that the benefits are marginal and the burdens to out-of-state coal producers are substantial. Hard to know how that's going to come out, but an important issue to follow um, in thinking about the legal challenges that are coming. The, the last one, the last challenge, the third challenge to, to this law is really going to be regarding what's called preemption. Preemption is the idea that when states have plenary authority to regulate on, or on whatever issues they want to, they, are, they were sovereign until the formation of the United States, and they retain all authority not claimed by Congress. Congress has limited authority to regulate in a number of areas, of course, limited in theory, in fact, under the guise of the Commerce Clause, Congress regulates in all sorts of areas. Um, and in particular, Congress has long and well-established authority to regulate air pollution and wholesale electricity markets. Um, EPA regulates air pollution under the Clean Air Act. And I'm sure many of you are aware that they have been zealously asserting the authority to regulate greenhouse gas air pollution over the last several years. FERC has claimed authority to regulate in wholesale electricity markets. It remains to be seen um, how they or entities that may be impacted um, by um, California's climate change laws will view its, their impact on wholesale electricity regulation. But a few principles are worth talking about. First of all, there's a presumption on the part of the courts against laws being preempted by, state laws being preempted by federal law or regulation. Usually, you know, the presumption is the states win, absent more. Um, what more can overcome that presumption? One thing is just express preemption. Um, the express statement on the part of a particular piece of federal legislation that it preempts all state law in the area. Now, this is a problem, actually, in this area, because the Clean Air Act does preempt most state air pollution law. It delegates back to the states certain authorities to enforce federal law, but it claims the field um, for air pollution, except in certain respects, except to the, to the extent that California elects to adopt strict, stricter air pollution laws than the federal standard for motor vehicles. But we're not talking about motor vehicles in most respects when we talk about AB 32. We're talking about, certainly they're a part of the, cover, of the coverage under cap and trade, although, but the, a large part of the coverage and the, is, is stationary sources, power plants, cement, um, other heavy industry. And for those sources, federal law explicitly preempts state law on air pollution grounds. Um, so there's a potential problem here. One argument might be that uh, Congress never intended the Clean Air Act to preempt 
greenhouse gas regulation. Now, of course, that doesn't work because EPA's made exactly the opposite, or I'm sorry, challengers have defeated EPA on exactly the opposite argument in the Supreme Court. That's Massachusetts versus EPA. The Supreme Court has ruled that greenhouse gases are a pollutant under the Clean Air Act, or, and if they're not, or if, if, and if EPA has, decides not to regulate, that they have to provide some reason basis for doing so. EPA has decided to regulate, and so in effect they have claimed the field. Um, how does EPA regulation work? Could the state apply to EPA for uh, some sort of courtesy pass, something that says if you implement a cap and trade that looks like California, that's going to count as compliance with EPA rules under the Clean Air Act? Maybe. But EP, the, the rules that EPA are, are rolling out are really technology standards. They're things, uh, two, two standards, reasonably available control technologies and best available control technologies that cover um, new source review, something called new source review under the Clean Air Act, and um, cover the continuing operation of power plants and large stationary sources that operate in areas that are not in attainment. Um, and that, because attainment hasn't been defined for greenhouse gases, essentially means that every large stationary source in the country is either going to be subject to racked or backed. Um, now, a regulation or policy has, su such as emissions trading, has never been allowed as, as, com as substitute compliance for a technology, for an engineered solution to emissions under these standards before. So this would be new legal ground for EPA and California to venture out onto. I, I think it's highly likely that they will venture out onto that ground. But that in itself is going to generate a challenge. Because for the entities in question, I mean, they, 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 I think there's a strong desire to defeat both EPA on their legal basis for regulating under the Clean Air Act and California. And they may, they're going to try to pursue both angles. Um, Another complicated question that will have to be resolved in this context is which cap and trade is tough enough to substitute for compliance with an engineering standard, with a standard that says if you capture this much of the carbon or if you have this emissions intensity from a coal-fired power plant, then you comply with best available control technology. Because we've got more than one. We've got REGI in the Northeast, which has a really, really uh, a cap that is not terribly stringent. In fact, arguably, it's not even binding right now. It might become binding in a second trading phase if that's implemented. But it's a very weak cap today. And certainly relative to California, it's, it's not stringent. So which, which um, cap and trade is good enough? And is there somewhere in the middle that sets the, sets the sort of lowest common level of acceptability? And how does EPA? rationalize that decision, because it would seem to imply something about the stringency of overall US emissions, which would then trigger, um, potentially trigger other aspects of the Clean Air Act that EPA doesn't want to see triggered right now, um, in particular the National Ambient Air Quality Standards uh, setting process. Um, FERC preemption, less clear that this is an important issue, but it's one that will likely also see its day in court. The question of whether the Air Resources Board and, and more broadly California is impermissibly venturing into territory that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission gets to control because of the statutory authority granted to it by Congress. Not clear, clear that there are going to be impacts on wholesale electricity markets. Um, it's unavoidable if the program is to work. If we were to get rid of the interstate components of this program, we'd have tremendous amounts of leakage. That is, we'd be importing lots of electric power from out of state, and the resources that weren't renewable or nuclear in state would basically import, export their power to Nevada in exchange for dirty power coming back the other way. So that's, that's not a um, tenable solution from an environmental perspective.
but whether the solution we've come to can survive challenge um, as interfering in FERC's regulatory authority really remains to be seen. Um, so I'm going to wrap up so there's plenty of time for questions. The, this is sort of the good and the bad. On the one hand, we have an amazing rule. ARB has done a tremendous job. And I think anyone who works on the analysis of cap and trade market design who's looked at this reg comes away pretty impressed. Pretty impressed that a state could do this. Uh, pretty impressed with the level of engagement that is clear in the rule with other um, cap and trade markets and engagement with the lessons and the mistakes that those other markets have made and incorporating those lessons into the California design. Um, and pretty impressed with the ARB's ability to navigate what has been a very difficult political environment and still to end up at a program that is stringent and also uh, recognizes the need, the uncertainty about what the ultimate cost of the program will be and so builds in buffers to prevent the program from becoming politically unsustainable, right? Because it's not the case, of course, that a cap and trade program would be allowed to sink the California economy. The reality is that it would be suspended very quickly if that ever became a question. Um, and so ARB has, ex has utilized very astute um, regulatory and political skills in getting us to this point. But this point isn't the end game. And that's because of the federal limits on what states can do, what activities states can engage in that impact other states and commerce in other states and the commerce between states. And because of the extent to which federal law may already govern this terrain because of the efforts of the Obama EPA. Um, so with that, um, thanks for coming. And I'm happy to um, take questions. Michael, um, could you talk a little bit more about how California may survive the claim that their AB 32 is engaging in extraterritorial uh, regulation? It seems to me that when that electricity comes in California borders, the electrons, no matter how they're generated, are indistinguishable from any other electrons. So they're just electrons being moving. So then the only difference between those that are generated with a heavy carbon intensive process is the method that were used in another state to right. generate the electricity. So if California is saying, I want to make a difference based upon the methods you use to manufacture or generate the electricity in that state, mm -hmm. when the product is identical, independent of how you do it, how is that not extraterritorial uh, regulation? Well, from that perspective, it certainly looks like it. Uh, and the, the argument that I think uh, that the state AG will have to make is that that, in fact, is not what's going on. Um, what's going on in this regulatory program is the intent of this regulatory program is to limit um, the impact that purchasers of electricity have on the California environment due to climate change. I think that, in a nutshell, is the case they're going to have to make. Now, they'll also have to, they, they won't be able to deny, of course, that that has extraterritorial impacts, right? It's going to impact the, because of the size of the California electricity market, because there are these, insta these um, installations outside of the state that basically are dependent on revenues from the state historically have been, it's going to impact the Western electricity market um, in ways that harm coal-fired generation. Um, the AG will have to win the argument that that harm is incidental and that the purposes the state is pursuing are legitimate environmental protection objectives and that the um, and that the harm to the out-of-state generators is outweighed to, to a significant extent by the 
benefits to the state. The, I think the one question I have is how a court will evaluate, I think, the claim that ARB would want to make that they realize that this is going to have a marginal impact on, um, on um, greenhouse gas emissions globally, but that sort of the, the categorical imperative argument that if everyone took that position and there were no first movers, that we're never going to make progress on this, this problem. And it's, it's that particular issue has really never come up in a, in a dormant commerce clause context. So I don't know how, it's, it's unclear, and it's going to depend a lot on the court, the sort of general perspective of the court as to these issues, how they rule on that. Um, so I want to ask that question in a slightly different way. So let's assume that, um, that the A32 cap and trade program is intact. Um, and I um, wish to purchase uh, electrons from Nevada. Um, how do I establish whether those electrons came from the new big uh, solar thermal plant or from the, the coal plant that's up the road uh, a ways? How, there, does that require a special contract with the, the, um, uh, the solar thermal plant that says, I'm selling these electrons to you? Yes. In short, yes, it does. Well, once those electrons are on the grid, of course, they're going to They're going to go wherever they're going to flow down here. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. But, but that does mean that that entity can't sell them to somebody else. Yeah, and, and there's a, actually a more complicated uh, possibility, which um, some have alleged is, is, is potentially um, already going on, going to continue to go on to an increasing extent um, with British Columbia, which is that British Columbia exports hydropower and would like to export a lot more to California. British Columbia also imports a lot of coal-fired power. So what they may end up doing is exporting more hydro, importing more coal, um, because it's in their economic best interest to do so, and that would not exactly accomplish the environmental objectives intended. I think yesterday I was reading on one of the California websites that the cap and trade program is for five states. And so why wouldn't the attorney generals of the other five states um, all you know, agree, then you don't get into this interstate problem between the five states around California? Um, so the first thing to say is that that was the idea. But then. <laughs> Elections happened, and now and, and the that idea, something called the Western Climate Initiative, uh, was created by governors via executive order. Uh, in only two states, California and New Mexico, has it moved beyond that phase. And in New Mexico, the fate of the cap and trade program is is to put it mildly unclear. The, the regulatory agency in charge hurriedly enacted regulations kind of at the 11th hour before a governor was elected. Actually, both, both people running in the governor's election in New Mexico said they would act to repeal and, uh, any kind of cap and trade program that New Mexico enacted. So the, the fate of the New Mexico program is unclear. Everywhere else, there, there is no indication um, at this point that people are moving forward. The exception to that, the WCI also extends into Canada. And a number of the Canadian states are moving forward. So we may have this uh, federal or sort of international state-based cap and trade program grow up. That's going to raise separate preemption powers that I didn't, or issues that I didn't talk about involving the plenary authority of the executive to engage in foreign policy. But that's, that's another talk. Richard. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I'd like to ask you about whether the California RPS in the context of power trading and interstate commerce is a relevant precedent for the interstate challenge that you're discussing because in essence what we have under the state RPS is a lot of regulations that regulate the interstate power trading and imported power that come into California. Now in that context obviously it's a, it's a positive incentive, it's a payment um, to the out-of-state entity which is probably a distinction that should be made here versus carbon, which is essentially a fee 
levied on those, those folks, so maybe that's a relevant distinction. But we have had an interstate power trading. Uh, right. We subsidize, we right subsidize out of state renewable power. So is that going to come yeah. up in a relevant way in this case? Do you think? Um, Probably not, and the reason is that is, is the difference between a subsidy and a tax. Um, we are, for better or worse, free to um, force our investor-owned utilities and, well, investor-owned utilities to, to buy lots of um, renewable power, at, thus raising the value of renewable power in, in other markets. But we're not um, necessarily free to um, reduce the value of other kinds of assets. In, out of state. Um, stepping back a little bit away from just the uh, carbon trading emissions, the new proposition that put in place in California, which will give us issues in enacting further environmental legislation that Absolutely. puts in place. What are ways, besides going through the supermajority, are there any other ways that could be valuable to enact new legislation? You know, I think it's going to be a very tough uphill road um, because, you know, arguably, you, you could make the argument that a cap and trade program doesn't amount to a tax. I think you could maybe even win that argument in court. But when you come, when you start talking about things that really do require a fee in order to su support a, a permit, a permitting system, or to support a program that offsets harms created by particular activities. Those are explicitly covered by the proposition. And so moving forward in California, it's going to be very hard to fund those um, on a sort of polluter pays principle in the way that we have up to the present. Because they're going to require supermajority. And that just is a tough burden to meet. Great. Let's thank Professor Mora. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.